Welcome to episode 32 of Lost Signals, and I'm joined by a very special guest, Mr. Chris Klein. How are you doing today, buddy? Wonderful, man. Absolutely wonderful. How about you? Uh, I'm fantastic. I'm having a coffee. It's like 12.30. It's usually, this is a little earlier than I normally do interviews and stuff because I work night shifts some days, but uh, for you, I, I you know, I, could, I can get my ass out of bed and yeah. put, put a show <laughs> no, on. That's awesome. Yeah. I, yeah. I'm usually, uh, uh, usually a nighttime guy too, but uh, just the time this week is afforded to afternoons. That happens. You got kids and life happens, you know, right? So yeah, oh. let, let, let's get right into your music stuff. So like we, we've collaborated a, a, a couple times on some shows and stuff. And uh, yeah, like uh, my, our bands have played, you know, shared the stage. Uh, I think it, it was like that pot fest or something like back in like 2013, yeah. like way before pot was legal. My old band, Broken Roads and Firing in the Sky, we, uh, you guys headlined, we opened for you. And probably one of the most interesting shows that I've ever played because... I concur on it on every level. Yeah, it was a, it was a strange one. Like, I got the, lots of stories from that night. The, the the crowd was just not into it at all. Like it's like well, it, why do you say that? So so that that takes me to the first story I have about that night. So yeah. so we got talking to the guy afterwards, and he's like, "Oh, it was that was great, man? That was fantastic, fantastic." And just to set the scene, this is a a, a medical uh, pot fest show, right? So basically, it's medical marijuana. And they do this trade show looking thing where they're where they're pushing their wares and and uh and and basically they have like testing and judging and all sorts of stuff on for medical marijuana so yeah. it's people with licenses if you will are hitting this thing right and uh and we got asked to play this we thought oh, it'll be fun you know let's, let's see what it's about and this is like people sitting in it, it lounging on sofas that they brought out this mat you know at the o'brien's uh, i guess coors event center now but yeah. it's o'brien's yeah. Uh, basically everybody's lounging in on couches watching you play and i mean we're doing you know a more hard rock metal set and and these people are you know sucking on a hookah and just <laughs> yeah. sitting back just just as pie-eyed as possible you know completely zoned out and we finished the set and we talked to the guy and we're like you know hey how's it going and he's like oh man that was amazing that was amazing it was so good that that was the best response i've ever heard after all these years of doing this and i was like there was no response whatsoever. I mean, uh, I wondered if people were even alive. Like I, I it was so silent, and and I guess you know maybe he did the rounds and went around and talked to everybody, and 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 the response was great. But they to the, to him, but to us, it was it was so it was dead. Chill. I, remember, I remember that <laughs> it was a two days show, you know. But I mean, as valiant out as possible. I mean, it was so. Well, I remember that guy sitting on a couch on the stage, and he's like, yes, he's cheering and stuff. It's like. Like we we thought we played okay, but it's like what the hell is going on here? It's like yeah, like all the volcanoes sitting on all the uh, the the tables at the like the yeah. like people on the couches. Like I didn't know what we were getting ourselves into, but I mean we we got paid and we got some free beer out of the that's yeah it was fine. Yeah, yeah, it was fun. I think the guy on the stage was actually like a uh, for the hearing impaired um, type person. He was that that guy that was to to kind of wake up the other people on the couches. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. Supposed to applaud everyone. Hey, you're supposed to cheer. Everyone. Yeah. Like, oh, oh, oh. Okay. Yeah. Okay. okay. Uh, I mean, when, when, that was awesome. when you get that many stone people all in the same room, usually nothing <laughs> good happens. I mean, it's funny. Oh, I, that's, that's why I don't smoke when I play because I, I'm exactly the same way. I have a hard time oh, yeah. moving from cue to cue. Like I can, yeah. I can play a riff, but then I forget to move to the next riff because I'm so into it at the moment that I just don't move forward. <laughs> I just, oh, we changed. We yeah, changed. I, yeah. Or if there's oh, a key change or something, or it's like. <laughs> Or if you got yeah. to sing, it's like, yeah, I don't, I, I can have a few beers before I play, but usually not, uh, I, I can't, yeah. I can't smoke or take anything before that. I, I think that's the drummer's vehicle is the, those guys, uh, you know, they're, they're pretty good when it comes to weed because they, it helps really dial them in and set. Cause yeah, it, to play drums, it's a very feel very like, you yeah. know, to, to have the best groove for it, you can really dig in. Right. But yeah. I think playing technical, really technical, it, that, it was something you definitely don't want to get it, yourself involved. It depends on the drummer because I played in a band where our drummer smoked a huge joint before a show one time and like his he slowed everything down so much that like it was noticeable. <laughs> yeah, it was no, funny. No. It was it was great, yeah. you know, but it was just like, come on, man. <laughs> like like maybe <laughs> like smoke whatever, but like don't like don't have to like don't smoke that much that you're screwing the songs up, but Yeah, I think sometimes people just forget how much their tolerance is or Yeah. And they just 
to get up there hoping for the best. I mean, we've all been there where we had one or two many, many pints and got up there and, uh, this wasn't a good idea. I thought, I thought I could do four or five before I started. It wasn't so good. There's a, uh, like, I kept rolling. I, I've played shows that I don't remember, you know, cause <laughs> you, you yeah. have a bunch before. And actually that's one of the shows that we, uh, we, we both played at is that, uh, the, uh, that the show we did for my buddy, Jason, that passed away. Uh, it was a rough day for me to begin with. So, mm -hmm. uh, yeah, that was uh, a real drink for sure. Yeah. It was, I mean, it was a good time and the, the show was good. Like anything I saw from it was good, but don't remember much playing on stage that night. <laughs> That was a wonderful time, though. I mean, it was a really good, uh, a good homage to him. You know, the celebration of life was yeah, it was pretty cool. I had it like I had I had these huge grandiose plans on like I wanted to bring my old band back together and have bagpipers for it because like that's what Jason listened to. That's that style of music, like uh, oh. like Dropkick Murphys and stuff like McQuig that. Quake, yeah, kind of stuff. Yeah. yeah, and it you know it just didn't work out. But like, what well, I think what we did was great. You know, we like and I I I'd like to do it again. And I was actually in talk with, uh, with Jason's wife, Christina about it at, and we may consider doing it again. It's just, we want to wait till the pandemic and shit is all done with, you know, like once everything's open again, but yeah, yeah, yeah. Be able to let everybody kind of come at it. So, yeah. So but they, they, they announced today they're going to ease up on passports and everything else. So that's a plus. It's, it's, it's to... yeah. I, I, I'm torn on it. You know what I mean? Like, like, I don't know, like I, I'm ready to, for everything to be open. But at the same time, it's like, I don't want the healthcare shit to, you know, be inundated. Yeah. You know yeah, what I mean? Like it's open, it's going to stay chill and everybody's yeah. happy. But, uh, but yeah, it's, it'd be nice for uh, businesses to get back at it. Yeah. And, you know, like, let the capital open itself back up and yeah, it'd be yeah. and everybody yeah. really get some shows going again. Yes. So, so, okay. So like back to COVID stuff, like have, did you catch it at any point during, during this? I did. I, I be, I'm barely over it actually. I, I got it. New Year's Eve. Yeah. I got a New Year's Eve a show New Year's Eve and uh was sick for over two weeks um just couldn't seem to shake it I had to go on antibiotics that um just to kind of clean myself out and finally oh, wow. get back to the normal so yeah uh, I played my first show January 22nd then I had to cancel something on the 15th all because um all because I was so sick yeah but I just couldn't make my way like uh, I, I was really hoping I could do it for the 15th I was holding out hope but yeah no there was no way so it, like, to yeah. me went up and then came back down for me so like i i felt good after i started to feel better after five days and i was just about ready to kind of get back at it and then i just took a big nosedive again yeah. on day six and then just got worse and worse and worse as i went so damn i was a little bit afraid i even had a shortness of breath thing for a bit that kind of panicked me because i had a really hard time breathing you know and, uh, it kind of shocked me it just came out of nowhere i couldn't catch my breath yeah and I just had to go into a bit of a singer's you know, respiratory meditation, breathing technique, had to kind of do that to get myself to calm and, and, and get that oxygen in my lungs again. So yeah. it kind of freaked me out a bit, but yeah. I, yeah. I had it a couple of weeks ago too. And it's like mine for me though, like, it, like I've had hangovers that were worse than that. Like mine, my yeah. case is so mild. Like it just, I laid on the couch the one day I was sweating a little bit. I had a little bit of a fever, but that was it. But I tested positive. So. Yeah. And that's how it starts to get the fever in the body. <laughs> else i've talked to yeah but it, it was respiratory stuff i mean i've had pneumonia before and things so i yep. think that that that's an automatic uh you know just kind of pushes the situation a little bit worse for yeah. every time you get or cold it just kind of goes right into your lungs so yeah so but it did, I, I didn't stop coughing until like the 23rd 24th oh, really? I didn't stop coughing until, yeah so i i couldn't get it out get it out of my system until almost february so yeah and i i, I still have a little bit of a cough from mine but yeah. they, they say like with the the variant that I had, it's like it that might you might have that for two three months. Yeah, who knows, mm -hmm. right? Is what it yeah, is. Yeah, the Delta was way worse apparently. So that's uh... yeah. I'm glad I got the one that I did. I mean, yeah, me now, now now it's over. Yeah. So okay, yeah. so like, has that affected your your singing ability now? Like, has it like has it any like any detriments? Has it uh, like like can, no can, can no not at all. I've, yeah. At worst, I think on the 22nd, when I played my, my one show on the weekend there, um, I, I had a, like one moment where I had to kind of stop singing it, <laughs> and yeah. get it out of there and had something just kind of build in and, yeah. and, you know, and then got that, but it was just one time, one time it kind of got me and then I was over it for the rest of the night. So oh, that's good. Yeah. So, no problem. Okay. So let, let's, let's go way back. So like, what got you to the point where you wanted to 
make music like like how like like how old were you when you picked up a guitar and decided like this is like i, I, well, I started to, yeah i started learning guitar in in uh grade seven so i actually started, i picked up bass first so i yeah. played bass in, in like the uh, elementary school band and stuff like that and uh and then i picked up a guitar in grade eight and started playing that as well a little bit in the band as well as as well as bass guitar and then throughout high school i was just in like jazz band you know and concert band and all that kind of stuff too um and and, and i've been doing a country thing with my dad for for years after that right so in high school kind of, he he had a bass player that he used to play with and 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 that went away and so then he hired me on to play with him and uh and so then i started to do a lot of country and, and old-time rock kind of gigs with him um so i was a drummer before that so in grade five grade six i played i really fell in love with drums and we had a kit when i was a kid and i used to mess around with it all the time and, and that's what i first fell in love with the drums and then moved to bass and then moved to guitar and and from that point on so i mean i wasn't really a singer until probably midway through high school um i didn't really sing in public so my dad used to bribe me to sing when i was a kid you know, he used to play these gigs at malls and stuff like that. And when I was, you know, a four little five year old kid, yeah. you know, he would get me to come up and, and sing a song with them and bribe me with a chocolate bar to come up and, <laughs> and bribe people and play one, right? Yeah. But otherwise, um, uh, I wasn't really a singer until after high school, even really. Like, I mean, I did harmony stuff um, in, in, you know, grade 10, 11, 12, but not really a lead vocalist in, until, uh, until I left high school, kind of thing. Yeah. So, what was the first band that you were in, like, right out of high school? Well, in high school, I started uh, a, a couple of metal bands with a buddy, like in 11, 12. And so I started playing guitar and we did a couple of like the talent shows and all that kind of stuff yeah. and really, really got a excitement for it. Um, so the first band I was in was called Aggressive Evil. Uh, that was the first band that I kind of played in and, and put out a cassette tape and uh, got excited to, you know, get into the scene and be part of, you know, went to every metal show and all that. That was in like grade 11, 12. You, you, um, you really just dated yourself with a cassette tape, though. I mean... Yeah, exactly. Oh, yeah. 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 That was back in the day, man. That's all you had was a task cam and, you know, yeah. you couldn't afford to go into an actual studio and record yeah. back in the day. So. But it did really well. It actually charted in Meat Magazine. Really? Like, they, did a, they did a review and gave four out of five stars on it in, in Meat Magazine. I still have the copy of it. It was, like, from 90, 92. Holy shit. I think I still have a copy, but I couldn't believe it that it actually did well because usually those those reviewers were pretty brutal like oh, yeah. you know the production wasn't great because again it was a task cam and you know did the best we could with it but otherwise uh uh it was and it was almost all me like i i just did it all on myself so i sang yeah. and, and uh, like did a, the growl vocal i should say and and uh played guitar and had somebody come do bass tracks and otherwise i'd used the drum machine and programmed it all and yeah. so it was pretty shocking to get four out of five um do you, do you still have a do you have, still have a copy of the tape? I might have one somewhere, but I haven't seen it forever. I know every so often someone will send me a note and say, "Man, I still have a tape. Press evil." And they just laugh and like, "You want a copy? I'll make one for you." And like, but make it. Oh man. But yeah, thought about it forever. Remember when dubbing tapes was a thing? Like, oh yeah. Like oh man, like uh, dual cassette decks. That was just that was that was the shit back in the day. Absolutely, it was what everybody wanted. <sighs> be able to get something from a buddy you know because music just wasn't available to you you know you had to you know to make money you had to actually uh get out there and play and you couldn't afford to go you know into a studio and you couldn't afford to to get all the heavier gears you just yeah. had to copy from somebody else and and you know other than columbia house there was no way to even buy me without without draining your bank account as a young oh, man yeah yeah, yeah. <laughs> so many times i signed up for columbia house and you know it's got screwed over so many times. I think we, I think all of us did that. Yeah. It, like both the CD and the movie club. Cause I, cause that seemed like a good idea when you're like 12, 13 years old, right? Oh, I can get all these movies for a dollar CDs for tapes for a dollar. Yeah. It never turns out good, but that should have been the watchword for, uh, for streaming music for free, right? For Napster and guys when they created it, that should have told the whole industry. Remember Columbia house? Remember how we, we told people if you, you could get all this free stuff for, or for a penny, get all these, and then you had to join us and, and buy X amount of CDs after yeah. how bad we screwed? Do you think it's going to go any better when we offer free streaming music? Do you think anybody's going to subscribe to services? No, they're just going to just going to download everything and get from free from every black site. That... And people forget how easy it is to, to, to steal stuff like that, right? Like it just, it's the way of the internet. A couple clicks and you got it. 
Yeah, that's right. <laughs> I mean, I don't do that anymore. I do. No, I, me neither, but. Yeah. Just, Spotify is expensive. It can be. I mean, yeah. I shouldn't talk too much since, you know, I'm on Spotify myself, but I mean, whatever. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so, so after that, what, like. So then I, I basically kept going one death metal band to another. You know, yeah. like I, I would create a, a death metal band and work with some guys and, you know, I have a hard time. <clears throat> The lineup and then get another lineup going yeah you know you know, you know kids out of high school right yeah you know not really you know guys got jobs and, and girlfriends and things just kind of keep yeah going the ebb flow of up and down with with playing and so it just kind of kept coming in and fading away yeah so uh, so i did that until until geez i think i did that did that for about four or five years and then i finally created uh morally sound um, back in 96 or 97, I think is when yeah. I kind of started, started it up. Yeah. You know, I, I remember watching you guys somewhere in the city at some point years ago, like probably early 2000s set, maybe buds. I don't know. Maybe, yeah, but... um, maybe amigos. I don't know. Like that, that's, that's a hundred years ago now, but I mean, yeah. Yeah. Um, Tell me about Morally Sound. Like I like I remember it, but I don't. Like what was like I know there's a lot of people around the city that that remember that, but like what like what was that experience like in like so yeah, being in a let's let's call it like a like a provincially famous band in the late 90s early 2000s. Oh, it was an absolute blast. I mean, uh we got to play some pretty high profile shows, you know, the, the, the DV8, which was the big huge festival, skate park festival yeah. right there on right beside the bridge and you know we used to do the lake every year in Minidosa and things like that right so got to play for some labels a couple of times and you know so we, we got to do some fun stuff uh it was awesome it was so much fun but at the same token it was it was hard to keep a lineup because you're you're just we were trying to do something with the music and trying to get out there and and uh and it just kind of kept every time it kept moving around on you it would kind of reset you and have to go through the hunt to find someone and then get them up to speed and then yeah. you know doing the round of shows so we only ended up putting out two cds but we were around for like seven years yeah that's cool yeah, yeah. that dv i remember that festival I, I drove by it i never went to it but i remember like just the hype around it oh it was so cool it was such a good time that's uh again like that late 90s early 2000s lifestyle it was very it was a weird time to be alive and especially yeah. being... it was funny because i remember them announcing like right before we went on stage right like extra pressure they announced Today's attendance has been 10,000, 10,000 people. And I was like, oh my God, like 10,000 people. <laughs> right before, like literally we're yeah. standing on the stage plugged in and they announce it. I'm like, oh, uh, that's a lot of people. Yeah. So <laughs> it was like a plus 35 days yeah. of just roasting to. Yeah. So we were extra sweating then. So, so would have that been the biggest show you've played professionally or has there yeah. been other? Yeah. 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 Definitely the biggest one. Yeah. Most amount of people for sure. You know, we played on a few big stages, but that was definitely the, the biggest turnout. Yeah. So, like, did you guys open for a bunch of people or just... Uh, yeah, just... it was like a festival. So, it was... I think we played at, like, once it was, like, four thirty, five o'clock kind of thing right before. So, I think Gob came out right after us. Oh, nice. And then... And then... So, there was, like, two or three headliners right after. So, we got the supporting slot to all the to all the big bands that were coming out right before that. So Nice. Yeah. Yeah, that's... So that was... That would have been a good show. I, I've never seen Gob before, but I mean, that would have been awesome, like opening for them. But oh yeah, yeah, yeah. they're fun, fun and fun guys. Yeah. yeah. So, so okay, so you said Morally Sound ended like say mid two thousands. It was two thousand four, I think, when we maybe two thousand five when we packed it in. So yeah. like, do you still talk to these guys? Like, is it something like? Would you ever like do a reunion show? You know, say like when well, stuff. Two thousand ten, I think it was two thousand ten. We did a reunion show. Yeah, we did. Yeah, that was a blast. It was so much fun. It was a nice packed house and everybody had a great time, I think. Yeah. And, uh, but yeah, I, I still keep in touch with Armand, amazing drummer. I mean, he doesn't drum anymore, but uh, oh. I keep in touch him all the time. You know, just we shoot each other notes back and forth about stuff. And yeah. I've played with Firing the Sky. I played in Calgary a couple of times. He came out both times that we played there. Um, you know, very supportive in everything that I do. The guy is so yeah. um, amazing guy. Oh, that's awesome. And, and, and uh, you know, I still see some of the other members off and on here and there, you know, kind of try to keep touch um, with them every so often. Yeah. Yeah. That's awesome. Yeah. Okay. So let, let's move on to Firing at the Sky then. So when did that start? Like, did that come out of the ashes of Morally Sound or was it just like the, the next natural progression of, 
your 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 career or did you start doing solo stuff before firing at the sky started well actually i did a band right after uh right around the same time as we did the reunion show we started a band called the divided so that was in 2009 we started jamming yep. and then 2000 and i did the reunion show and i actually had the bass player you know kaylin yeah um yep. Kaylin, so I, I uh, so he came and played as the bass player from Rolly Sound that night. Um, and then I had some of the former bass players come out and do a few songs here and there um, for the night as well. But Kalen was the mainstay throughout the night. Um, and so we had already started this other band called The Divided. And, and that was with uh, Darren Rowett and Cody Johnson and, and Kalen. Yep. And that did for, I want to say, three years, three, maybe four. So we started recording an album. And, and, and so I have actually... Re released an album with those guys as well yeah. um so that was the the post morally sound but i had taken some time off after morally sound had a family and and just kind of started getting life together off the road because we played morally sound was a road band like we toured back and forth across the country numerous times in a row for years yeah um so that was mostly life was just playing right so yeah. when i hit 30 that was when it was like okay I got the kid on the way and we gotta kind of settle down a little bit and live life a little bit more normally yeah. a little more at home yeah yeah <laughs> um so then fire against scott you guys were early what say like 2010 2011 12 through there or uh, or was it so late? 2009 to about 2013 okay and then uh 2000 i think we I can't remember what year we released the album, but we've released it way after we were kind of done as a band. So the other three members got jobs working for the railroad. And so they were never off together at the same time. Oh yeah. Uh, it's so unless they, unless they had to book off actual time to be able to play, it just was impossible. Right. So you'd have to basically plan for months in advance to do a show yeah. and, and do that show. So there was no chance of ever touring or ever doing a real major support thing with that. So, so that's when I kind of, you know, I, I kind of held out hope for a little bit that, that things would settle in a little bit more with them and, and they'd be a bit more available. And when it didn't happen, I started, I thought, well, I'll start writing in a bit of a different direction. So I started writing the stuff for Firing the Sky in the 2015 phone, uh, phoned up a drummer buddy and asked if he wanted to, uh, um, try, uh, drumming to some of the tunes, see what he thought of them. I forwarded it to him and he was in love with it. And, uh, and from there, um, we just kind of started looking for members and pulling things together. Yeah. So we started, thinking, I think, for the first time in 2016. So it's funny. I was going through some old files the other day. And it's like I found some of your guys is like not it, they they weren't firing sky demos or anything, but they're like they they seemed like it was something you guys recorded in a studio, mm -hmm. and it was like a different mix or something. I think it was stolen and what was the other oh one? yeah yeah it's, sorry uh, stolen and uh, what the hell was that. Uh, tempting gravity. Yeah, we did that with um, with Darren Rowett actually at his studio. So we did. We were first. We're going to record a a demo of yeah. like three songs. We did that with Darren, and then when we were done recording those three, we basically had gotten some grants to record a full album. And so some of the prerequisites for for getting the grants was you had to you had to work with somebody else um, in a in a actual studio studio. Yeah. So Darren had his basement and we recorded that stuff so so we took his actual basic tracks and it presented those forward um got everything else um and so we redid the vocals and redid a few other things and presented that along with the rest of the studio stuff we recorded in the actual studio so so but he had done mixes for us and 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 everything and had kind of got it to that demo level but then we didn't need the demo because we got all these grants to record a full length so yeah. we never released the actual demo but if, if you found them online it wouldn't surprise me if if uh if Darren had posted them up because he was really big into, into doing um, mix competitions and stuff. So he yeah. would, he would submit a song and, and they, and put it in out so that people would, could judge how your mixes are and give you critiques and tips. And so yeah. he probably put them out there to, to see how people thought of his mixes. Yeah. I'm not even sure where I got him. I think maybe Mike, Mike Nikolaichuk maybe had sent him to me at one oh, yeah. time. Oh yeah. 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 No, I'm like, I, I, I they, pop on like I, I have an ipod that i just leave in my vehicle and like they're on there it's so like they pop on everyone so they're they're a great listen so you guys, you guys are doing something right there oh yeah darren did a great job of those like i mean his yeah. stuff was fun so yeah. we strove kind of when we got into the studio to get closer to his actual final product because his stuff was really had a real meat to it on the bottom end yeah. and, and so when we went into the studio we weren't quite getting the meat that we had gotten from him and so we kind of kept pushing back to <laughs> to find some of that nice low end and yeah. and grind that he had put on it. So. Yeah. 
So, yeah. so, so when did like the uh, like the solo singer songwriter stuff come in? Like, because I mean, you do that. Like, for people that don't know, I mean, like Chris plays a lot of like solo shows where like you play guitar but you have like a like a foot drum kit or like or like a what is it like sample board or something that you you like a I just use a looper so I oh, use a looper, looper and I create my own backing tracks like completely I play all the instruments on it create a backing track within the looper and then and then just put it back and then I have a, a vocal harmonizer as well that that uh, gives me whatever vocals I want and it's got a foot switch you can switch to different types of vocal harmonies three part two part four part whatever you need right damn yeah, yeah. So, so that must have taken a lot of practice to get good at, though. I mean, because like that's not just something like a person can just decide one day. It's like I'm going to start doing this on my own. But like that's got to take a lot of setting down and figuring out, would it not? Well, well, firing at the sky had to kind of have a bit of a hiatus um, at uh, what was it like 2018, 2019, something like that. I don't know. Yeah. 2000, 2018, we kind of took a bit of a hiatus. Yeah. And uh, and I wanted to keep my chops up, keep singing, keep doing something. So. A buddy of mine, uh, Travis Blanchard, had said to me, "Hey, like, why don't you come out and do acoustic shows with me? Like, it'd be fun. It's just, just like learn a half hour worth of songs acoustically because yeah. I know you can play and sing. So yeah. just learn." Stuff. So he invited me out to do a show at the Dog House. Uh, just get a half an hour material, come out, play it, and let's kind of wet your whistle on it. And so yeah. I did that. I was like, that, that was a lot of fun. So then uh, I booked myself another one uh, out in Martinsville at the Adobe and did that too. And I just kind of kept building from there. So I started doing just acoustic me singing and playing guitar shows um, for probably close to a year. And then I started doing shows where people wanted to dance. Um, you know, people wanted to, wanted to get, you know, more of that full band experience. Yeah. And so you, it, it felt really naked to just sing and play. Um, and so I just kind of started messing around with, with an idea to, to create my own samples um that i could have in the back would actually facilitate drums and and bass guitar and everything so that's what it so now it's basically a one-man band thing <laughs> well i mean like that's like that, like when we decided to get you to come for that show it's like because i had seen your cover of wide mouth mason's midnight rain that you put on youtube however yeah. long ago it's like I, I said to the people i was organizing that that show with it's like we have to get this guy because of this song and i knew i knew like obviously knew you before and like i knew your chops like like the, like this is amazing. Like, like I'll, I'm going to put a, uh, I'm going to link that and the rest of your stuff that we're going to get to yet. Yeah. Um, oh, yes. Like on our, on the Lost Signals Facebook page, because like they're, they're, they've got a lot of quality stuff there. So, mm. so let's talk about now. Like what's like, I mean, I know obviously, but like what's, what's happening right now? Like, I know you got two newer singles that we got one brand new one and then one couple weeks ago. So what's, what's up with, what's up with that? So, so basically what I started doing was, uh, in the pandemic, kind of some of the shows dried up, you know, the bars weren't kind of booking and stuff. So I started to work, you know, I had a little more time to work on my own original stuff. Um, so created a few more of my own original tracks and just figured now was the time to put them out. January is always kind of a good time to put songs out. People are, are fresh, open eared and, and, uh, not too many distractions, you know, football's yeah. almost over and there's no new sports coming online, no playoffs to get in the way. So I thought yeah. January was time to put some stuff out. And uh, so I had actually worked with, uh, so Andrew, of course, you know, Andrew Mabu, yeah. I worked with him on, on a song before called Give It All. Yep. And, and so I asked him to play on my newest song, Gravy. And so uh, so that's basically um, that song. And then the other one I'd been recording at home all on my own, putting it all together. So between those two songs, uh, uh, that's basically where I, I wanted to, I missed doing the band thing that I had done with Fire With The Sky. Yeah. And so I thought, well, you know, I'll just write some songs that sound like me and are for me and and bring them forward and see how they're received, right? Yeah. No, I, I yeah, yeah I was listening to them recently too. Yeah, I really enjoy them. They're great, great tracks. And a Andrew's a good guy too. I told him I was talking to him. Oh, he's amazing. Such a great, it's fantastic drummer. I mean, as, as tight as they get. I've, and then soul on top of it, it's, he's the full package. I, 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 I say this without a word of a lie. Like he is probably like the best drummer I have ever seen professional or otherwise like that's like that's how good this guy is so he, he can do it all there's yeah. there's there's nothing you can throw at him that will uh turn him sideways that's yeah for sure. and he, he's been on my podcast too so i mean it's, oh yeah it, it is fun to be around too so oh that, yeah like, that's already like that's always 50 percent of your game right it, it's it's tough to uh play to work with somebody and kind of get creative when when they're not a lot of fun to be around and oh, he's exactly. fun to be oh, around. yeah, <laughs> yeah. Like, yeah. Ooh, good good time you know? He's a good yeah. guy. 
Um, so, so like, how what's the reaction been to these these new tracks that you put out? Like, like, is it like uh, a good response or is it? Well, Gravy just came out, and so far so good. I mean, uh, it's been going well. So uh, the Wolf is going to be playing um, Gravy this week, nice. and Regina Rock One or Two is supposed to play it next week. So that's a good start. Um, so I've just been putting out the feelers to to you know kind of working out the radio packages and and seeing if I can't get a little bit more airtime throughout the country um, for that one. Um, Daddy's Home. I'm I'm actually doing an interview with uh, Country Radio CKBI on Thursday. And they kind of have a, a network of radio stations the interview will go out to uh, on Thursday. Um, so hoping to get a bit more airplay in rural Saskatchewan because yep. it's a country team. Yeah. Um, and they parlay that into into the bigger centers after that too. So nice. Yeah. Um, just I, I just basically just released them both. So January 17th, Daddy's Home came out. Uh, Gravy I put out January 31st. So now it's been the, you know, putting it out to the markets and seeing where it can get play and seeing who can yeah. do who, something with it. So yeah, no, I, I enjoy both of them. They're both uh both great tracks. Um, so what's next then? Like like, are you planning a bunch of shows coming up, or is there is, is there more firing at the sky stuff? Recently, or am I thinking of something completely? Yeah, yeah, yeah. no, knew, we, we really, uh, so we'd actually just just before the pandemic hit, we had we had started recording uh, a bunch of singles. And then everything hit, and so we couldn't play shows. So then we were just like, "Well, why don't we record a few more yeah. and just intermittently record, uh, release them as we go?" So that's what we started doing: release the a song, and then you know, say three months later, release another one, and three months later, release another one. So, yeah. so over the pandemic, we probably released five songs, oh, yeah. you know. Yeah. Total. So, um, so yeah. So right now, absolutely nothing going on with them. Um, because again, we've been waiting for, for things to open up again. Yep. Um, it, there's just no money in, in doing shows because the, the businesses are so hard hit um, and yep. people weren't coming out. So it just didn't feel like the right time to try to get anything happening again. So yep. so we'll see. We'll see, we'll see what, what the guys are doing and what's happening. But yep. um, in the no plan. So like, there's absolutely nothing, yeah. nothing happening. I, I, it's unfortunate, but I understand it 100%, right? Because like, like, if there's no money, no place to play, I mean, what do you really do? You know, like, yeah. it sucks, but yeah, we've got a few invites, but just haven't haven't bitten on anything yet. Yeah, you know, and but but solo like work, you're you're doing shows like every couple of weeks, right? Like pretty much, like yeah. The plan is to get heavy busy over the over the next bunch of months. So yeah. so my goal is really keep uh, keep a lot of gigs going, play a lot of shows. I, I, I'd like to do you know six, seven, eight a month if I can. Yeah. Um, you know, just try to keep it going and, and of course keep pushing the, the songs to radio. And then I've got a few more that are in the can that I'm, that I'm uh, just have to tighten up some things on and hopefully release some more songs and just try to work my way to the summer and hopefully get invited to some festival bids and get invited to some, some bigger profile shows, hopefully, and, yeah. and uh, keep music. That's, that's where I'm at right now. Yeah. So, so what are you using for marketing? Like for this, like, cause like we talked about this before, before we started like like you like you're using tiktok and that sort of stuff like like are you yeah so all the social media stuff, yeah and then i work through distro kit so that's where i put all my stuff on that, that then in turn goes to all the platforms and and then of course um i've done the dmbs thing before where you put it out to radio and radio's facebook basically so um you, you release a song on there for anybody who doesn't know what dmbs is you basically release a song to to radio stations facebook and they all the radio stations see all the new track listings and so you can just send a note to a station and say hey we're on dmds here's our code um go listen to our song see if it fits your format yeah and they then they then they choose to pick you up or not right um costly setup it, you know it's significant expense to put that through so but i've been thinking about doing that for for gravy already yeah um right toying with daddy's home as well putting them up there um just haven't locked down but i also um, I've got a friend who has a record company as well, and, and they do kind of a really nice marketing package that he's got to express some interest in working with me. So um, mulling that over is maybe a, a, a good fit to then get some a little bit more attention and marketing and putting things forward to all the stations and all the places where people love music. Yeah. 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 It, and it, it's funny, like, it's like there is all these different ways to get your product out there now. It's like just finding the right mix of one thing or another to get the, the proper traction i guess is the biggest thing right now but, yeah yeah and it, as we were talking before we started i mean <clears throat> the attention spans are so short right so yeah. so people are always looking for the the new exciting thing to listen to and 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 
a, a lot of the time you don't get much of a of a view from somebody you know they might yeah. give you 10 seconds and just gone right yeah so it's hard to catch people's eye and it's hard to get people's attention long enough to get them to to bite onto something right yeah so, for sure yeah like yeah like we were talking before it's like we do a long format podcast all the time and I have my regular listens, listeners that listen to the whole thing, but I can look at the metrics and like sometimes it's you know, 30 seconds, 45 seconds. That's all people listen to because they, they get their, they get what they want out of it and then they move on to the next thing. It's just, that's the way people are now, you know, like, but I think in general, people are looking for a connection, right? Yeah. Um, when it comes to music, when it comes to art, when it comes to podcast format. And so, I think when they click on, they're they're looking for that a little bit of an electrical spark right off the bat. Yeah. And if you don't give them that spark instantly, they're just like, well, I'll keep looking. You yeah, know? <laughs> yeah. It's the it's the whole the whole Tinder lifestyle. It's a quick swipe, swipe, yeah. swipe right. You know what I mean? Yeah. It's this, you know, give me that instant gratification so that I know this is about me or for me. Uh, otherwise, sorry, you yeah. had your man, yeah. you had your picture, you had your profile. I'm gone. Yeah, <laughs> I, yeah. I, I know I know the feeling, man. It just it, it is yeah. what it is. It's like. But so shifting gears here, let's, uh, let, let's talk about that wall of beer bottles on your wall there. Oh yeah. It's much bigger than what you can see too. So it's the, it's almost the whole wall. Damn. So it's all, yeah. All the way. And then I, I actually have a ton all the way up the stairs as well. Yeah. Uh, I pro- I, my, my wife begged me to pare it down. So I think it's probably at about 200 titles right now, but Holy shit. Uh, I think it was at almost 400 at one point. That's crazy. So like yeah, did, it was, did beers from like all over the place or, or what? Yeah, from all over the place. Like, I, and again, talking about connection for me, it was something that, that uh, I would pick up a ton of titles when I'd go somewhere and, and it would help me kind of remember the trip afterwards, you know, right. like you'd, you'd yeah. back, you'd be like, I got this from San Diego, or I got this from Portland, or I got this from Seattle. And, and, and then you could look on the wall and go, see, I remember when we were there or we tried yeah. this place. Or, this kind of was like having a picture of the, of the place to look at and remember yeah. fondly your visit you know i have a bunch of stickers like that because i go to seattle and down there with some buddies that live in vancouver and it's like we just yeah. every bar we go to or every brewery we just like try and get stickers or something it's like they're all over my my have my... you been to browers have you been to browers in yep. seattle yeah yep. yeah yeah browers is great um oh, yeah. uh there's one that was right downtown on the waterfront i can't remember the name of it but it was like in this shitty like old like industrial like warehouse and it was on the waterfront and it was busy and you could smell the fish market. Like that's how close we were to Pike's place yeah. and great beer though. Like you just, I, I really want to go back because like we do. we've been there, tw- like I've been there twice, but there's just so much that city is so big and like the beer scene oh. is so massive there. Mm-hmm. Like we went down, me and me and uh, some friends, we went down for uh, Seattle beer week. And we, we didn't even go to the downtown district. We went just north of it. I can't remember. Like, there's a, a term for it. But we stayed in Airbnb. And, like, all, we walked to, like, we went to, like, 20 breweries in one day. And we walked the whole way. And it was great. Yeah. That's the way to do. Yeah. I yeah. Mean, pretty full by the end of it. But, you know, we walked, like, 25,000 steps or something. But, uh, yeah, like, no, Seattle's great. Um, Vancouver's great for, for that beer scene, too. Um, yeah. So where, what's, what's the favorite, your favorite city that you've been to for craft beer? Um, I would say, I would say San Diego. Like, I mean, I absolutely love San Diego, yeah. uh, California just because of the reach. So it wasn't so much that it was San Diego beer as much as I love San Diego beer and, and a couple of their, their breweries are, are some big time favorites. Um, just having the, when you're anywhere in California, you can usually get all the breweries of the entire state, um, right. in, in cities that you're in right so san diego i was able to 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 click on to so many of the amazing places uh almanac uh, society uh you know of course you, your mainstays like ale smith and stone and yeah. you know so i was able to try so many different places that that um i maybe only had one or two titles from before and really get into their deep stuff yeah so, and um, then stone escondido uh um they have a beautiful restaurant um and brew pub um that's basically in an old military complex oh nice uh, the military ba- uh, barracks that they had there so yeah. it looks like you know you remember the three amigos it kind of looks like the, it's like an old mexican military compound right with the wall stone walls all the way around yeah. and, and you stand on the top of the stone walls and and just beautiful garden in the center of it and 
and just a gorgeous place and some amazing beer and, and cuisine there. So yeah. that, that was one of the highlights of the trip for sure. That's awesome. Yeah, I, I'd love to get down there. Uh, I think Portland is next on my, my list to, of, of places to go for, for beer. Cause... Yeah, I had Portland booked in 2020 and then the pandemic hit and we uh, couldn't take our trip. But I actually bought tickets. Me and my daughter were going to go down and and uh, she was going to um, you know see a concert while she was there. And yeah. I was going to sample a brewery place and stuff. And, and so we had tickets and unfortunately no travel time. Well, so shit. Hope, yeah. hopefully soon a guy can get get start mm -hmm. doing some of these trips again because i know like my i'm i'm itching to go someplace and try some yeah. different beers and stuff i mean i've been to vancouver once in the last two years and it was definitely not enough you know yeah but uh well the place i'd like to get to of course is denver i'd like yeah. to get to denver uh I, you know i popped through once but i've never actually done a brew tour there yeah. and Ash, north carolina i can't uh, uh, they talk so hugely about it being an amazing, amazing like, uh, uh, place. Burial is there. Uh, yeah. Yeah. There's, there's a, actually uh, there's a, so I, I homebrew at the same time. Yeah. Um, there, uh, there's a, a YouTube channel called uh, the claw hammer supply and they, they do all this homebrewing stuff and they're based out of Nashville too. And it's like, yeah. it, it seems like it's got a really cool vibe there to be. Oh, so I had to Asheville, Asheville, North, North Carolina. Yeah, right? yeah. Yeah. What did yeah. I say? Oh, sorry. Nashville. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I thought I said Asheville. It's, 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 like I said, it's, it's early for me to be up. Well, I guess it's one thirty now. But. Well, I could have misheard. So. Mm. My hearing is best from, from lots of loud music over light. So. <laughs> yeah, I, I know the feeling. I know the feeling. Um, and I want to, uh, to so many places like uh, on the uh, East Coast. Like I'm, I'm super excited to get, you know, to places like Vermont and, and Delaware and, you yeah. know, just – Dogfish Head would be an amazing visit. Yeah. I, I kind of grew up in that era where, I don't know if you remember this, I don't know if you've been into beer as long as I have on this level, but um, there was no local scene here. Like, we had oh, nothing. Nothing. Padiquit, that was it. That's all and, I had. You know, and Padiquit for me was always hit and miss. Some stuff yeah. was okay, and then some was just like, mm. yeah. they, they've well, definitely gone... I, Happy stuff that was no good because they they kind of had the more traditional mindset where they yeah. they didn't want to to get into the hop stuff they only wanted German traditional and yeah, yeah. Belgian traditional nothing else right yeah so their dark stuff was always fantastic but their their lighter stuff was was always questionable yeah um uh, for me like I was into all these uh, the only thing you could kind of get was was uh, uh, imports that would come in from all these places um, so I'm I was hugely into getting my hands on anything from anywhere else. You know, like I was super excited about that. So we didn't have a scene. So I, I, I kind of, because I was kind of a fanboy of so many of the you know, Stone and, and Dogfish Head and all these huge breweries um, that that were the benchmark for craft brewing, that I'd still love to visit every single one of the yeah. of the days just to kind of say I've been there and tried some of their stuff. And, you know, it's just a bit of a fanboy vibe on that. Yeah. Like, I... I'm trying to think of like the first craft brewery besides Padiquit that that opened in even Saskatchewan. Like, I can't I can't think. Like like was it Rebellion maybe? Um, I, I even... want to say like a bunch of them kind of all opened at the same time. Yeah. So I want to say Rebellion was the first big one in Regina. Like Bushwhacker yeah. was all there, yeah. but yeah. Um, then Rebellion opened, and I think Nokomis had opened like very quickly after. Rebellion had opened, or maybe they were just getting started when Rebellion opened. Um, they just had their seventh anniversary Mile, beer. Yeah, Nine Mile was out there too a little bit, and, and Prairie Sun, had, uh, both those guys had opened up um, kind of on the heels of that. Uh, it seemed like everybody just started kind of popping up all, yeah. all around the time, so it got pretty exciting. And, and on the Rebellion front, it was it was great because uh, um, I had been talking with beer with Mark for so long, so I'd created that Beer Lovers of, of Saskatchewan Web, uh, Facebook page yeah and that was it was created by me because I was tired of so you to be able to get your hands on these interesting beers that would come to Saskatchewan if you didn't get there now you didn't get it yep. you know what I mean because find it and clean it out yeah and so I created that as a if you see it like well, tell us what you drink and tell us where you got it kind of yep. thing so I created a community so people could could be like oh we saw west Lateran and it was it showed up and, and then you got these gift packs there's only 10 of them get down there you know yeah. so you could get right, and run in and scramble and get it right and so uh i created that page for that so communities could happen all because we didn't have 
local craft beer beer scene. So yeah. Mark got in touch with me from there and it said, you know, hey, we're talking about opening a brewery and and you know, a few of your guys that you know regular posters on here, maybe you want to try some of our beer out before we come out. Yeah. And so he hooked us up all these growlers of everything that he'd kind of been leaning towards releasing um, when the brewery opened. And it was an amazing night. We had so much fun yeah. um, trying out all these beers. And we were so excited because it was finally a something, a local choice that was doing high end stuff. Yeah. Like it was serious quality. There was no more of this kind of home brewers feeling their way. <laughs> kind of, <laughs> yeah. This was full on, full on. Um, so we were so excited for Rebellion to open. Uh, yeah. I, I still remember that fondly that day. So yeah, Rebe- like it, it, it's hard to for me to to just or, or to pick what my favorite Saskatchewan brewery would be right now. Cause I I can't I can't because everybody has such good stuff out right now. I I think for me nowadays it's consistency, right? It's yeah. all about consistency. So uh, I'm very much a portfolio drinker. I want new, 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 new. Yeah. I, I I'm. I, I can barely I can barely work my way through a four pack, you know what I mean? Unless it's oh, yeah. so um, but otherwise I'm like, okay, had one, let's move on to the next. Yeah. And I have a hand of files that I adore. So that's kind of the only four pack, six pack chance I'm taking. Otherwise, um, I want singles, right? Yeah. And so I would say the most consistent for a new beer that's exciting or what I like, um, in Saskatoon at Shelter and yeah, yeah. and it, Regina, it's multinational, right? For me, those two are the ones that get me most excited um, for what's coming out new. Yeah. And having said that, I mean, Rebellion, Black Bridge, I mean, those guys just constantly don't disappoint. You know yeah. what I mean? They're just never endingly coming up with great stuff and, and consistent stuff. Like it's always good, good, good quality beer. You know? Have you been out to park in Warman yet? I've had a couple of park beers, but I haven't physically been in there. But it- I've, I've- beers and, and he brews good stuff he it's does tight. yeah but it's tight he had that an eight percent like an imperial lager and he was like holy shit this is really good but yeah it, it's not what you think when you walk in there like it's just no it's just a warehouse they, well, i saw some of the pictures of it i'm, I'm building it stuff and yeah and yeah. I, I was I, right away and a homebound out there too is brewing great stuff oh. i don't know if you had a chance homebound but i stuff is awesome i've been out like i've been in the brewery probably five or six times Oh, I, good, good. I buy that like, if I see it I, I usually buy a four pack of it like the uh, the, nice. the Dr. Beak that one is really good that IPA and he made yeah, yeah. A, a heavier version of it too I can't remember what yeah. it's called but so good um, yeah yeah actually, I like this just a little better than the rig yeah I, I even told like, or West Coast and the and the, the super Dr. Beak's a little more on the hazy side yeah yeah um, so what what's your favorite style right now like what, like when you, if you're going to Winston's right now, what, what's the first thing you're going to order? Oh, it's, it's funny you ask. Uh, cause I, for, if, if you'd asked me three months ago, I'd say always hazy IPAs. It's just yeah. nothing but hazy, you know, New England, just give it to me every day. I got to have it. Right. Yeah. And in the last two, three months, I'm really heavy on the stouts and porters again. I just can't get enough of, of good quality stouts and porters. Like, yeah. but. But I mean, would I open up a night with that? No, absolutely no, not. No, no. <laughs> it it's, just, it's too thick and chewy to start out a night with and then move to an IPA or yeah. a sour. Just, what? You know, it but, you know it, it's that time of year though. You know, it's cold, it's miserable yeah. out. You kind of want that, that, that heavy, you know, like throw one in, in the evening or something like, yeah. but it has to be good. You know, like, cause like I ruined stouts for myself back in the early 2000s because I would go to uh, Maguire's back in the day. <laughs> And oh, I, would, yeah. I would, I would always order Guinness and I'd have like four of them. And then, you know, they'd just be like heavy afterwards. So like, I couldn't drink stouts for years after that. Now I'm getting back into it, but yeah, it's, but it's that time of year. It's, you know, cold, miserable. You kind of want something like to, to put a jacket on yourself or something. Yeah, exactly. A warmer, right? But see, I was never like that. I mean, uh, I think when I first started out drinking craft beer, I was very stylistic to the weather and then I'm completely moved away from that. It was just like, whatever I'm in the mood for is whatever I'm in the yeah. mood for. It's funny. Cause I got away from stouts and porters big time. I had no interest in them earlier, earlier in 2021, no interest. Like you, I just, I would get one every so often and regret it almost yeah. instantly. My palate was just not there. It was always, I, I wanted gozas. I wanted IPAs. I wanted sours. I wanted, you know, yeah. anything that, that gave you that fruit 
flavor explosion, right? Yeah. And so, so it, that's what's kind of just flooring me that just out of nowhere, I'm nothing but stouts and porters lately. <laughs> it's got, <laughs> yeah. You know, oh, off it and then so on it. Yeah. It's, I'm like that too. Like right now, I'm on heavy IPAs because it's that time of year, you know, like give me like Rebellion's Hazy Double IPA or Black Bridges Double IPA. Uh, or uh, Black Bridge is uh, Scotty the T Rex. There, that double IPA, that's yeah. fantastic. And yeah, the, that was the artwork on yeah. that can is just nuts. Like th that's a chance to try the the uh, was it something kicking that 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 habanero IPA? No, I IPA? didn't. Oh, I heard that, about it. Yeah, so much burn. It's got so much burn on the finish. It's crazy. I I didn't expect it. Like I've had a lot of like uh, spicy finish beers before. Yeah. That one had the I've ever had like that one burned for a while like it was hard to finish it and it's funny because you pour it in the glass and and you see that hazy ipa yeah and then it red like somebody's poured sriracha in there really? it, it it turns to almost like so, there's a couple of drops of blood that have been spilled into your beer like it gets really red and uh and yeah it's got a lot of so, so who made that one because i'm gonna i'm gonna write that black, down. Black kicking and screaming or, or something kicking i can't remember what the title was something with kicking in the title anyways uh or she's got kick, something like that. Huh. Yeah, I'm gonna, I'm gonna have to try that because like hot sauce is like right up my alley, like hot, oh, hot food. Like big burn in her head. And I don't know if you ever had the Heartstopper from Attiquid. No. Nope. <clears throat> Heartstopper. So it was a chocolate, hot chocolate stout. Oh. And they would, uh, and they would get vanilla right from Mexico, um, to make it. Yeah. And it was delicious, but it had a nice burn in the finish too. Hmm. But this, this one is ten times more burn than that. I can write that one down too, because yeah, no, I don't think they. Even, I don't know if they make it anymore. Hmm. But uh, if you ever get a chance to have a hot chocolate stout, they're fantastic. Yeah. that they always kind of chili spice in the finish. Yeah, what the, I just found something. <clears throat> Excuse me, I go to Prince Albert every once in a while because I live kind of close there, and sometimes I don't want to go to Saskatoon. Uh, mm -hmm. At their co-op liquor store, they have a bunch of stuff that you can't find anymore. Yeah, yeah, like, lots of singles. I heard lots of singles. Like they have a whole shelf just of sours. Like it's, mm -hmm. it blows the one in Saskatoon out of the water. Like for, oh for, yeah. Um, there is the rebellion. I think the sixth anniversary beer there yet. Like they, they got some yeah, I, old stuff I, there. Where you're like, what? Why do they yeah. still have that? Yeah. But yeah. Well, I've still got it. Yeah. And they got, um, even like the pineapple sour rebellions, pineapple sour, which is probably yeah. the best pineapple sour that I've ever had. And oh, I, I've fantastic. had a bunch. It's yeah. I, I really like the fine half of wheat first by Blackbridge. Yes. Too. Yeah, it's, that's yeah. really good. Pretty good too. Um, expensive though, it seems. Like 22 or 23 bucks for a four pack. Depends on where you go, I guess. Yeah. Yeah. yeah it's it was, just going up. It, it seems like they, they've done something from taxation wise that yeah. just keeps incrementally bumping it. So I know it shocks you. You walk out of there with five beer and it's 30 bucks. Like, what? Yeah. yeah. 30, 30 bucks? I spent 30 on five beer. Yeah. Five. It's nuts. What do you do? You know, like, I mean, yeah, I'm going to, I'm going to pay for it. <laughs> yeah. So like we, like I always do here on the show, we always add two songs from, from a guest onto our uh, lost or found signals playlist on Spotify. Which <laughs> songs do you want to add? Cause we were going to add one of your new ones for sure. And then uh, I messaged you yesterday about like uh, another one that you would want to add on there. Oh, uh, I would say uh, I'm absolutely in love with ginger right now the band yeah. ginger i don't know if you heard tatiana oh, the vocals on so, her because she's the whole package whole fu package. funny story uh last episode we uh, myself and uh jd my co-host were talking uh he's interviewed tatiana for his oh, podcast really? wow which what we're trying to do <clears throat> is uh when they come through saskatoon is we're going to try and see if we can get an interview at sas place with them oh that's too cool that's, that's great <clears throat> that's yeah. that's what we're trying right now but yeah no gingers fan they're fantastic oh, so i would say ginger outlander would be a, a good pick perfect um I mean, so many good songs by them pisces vortex i mean i got so many great tracks but uh i think if you're looking for an energy boost on your playlist that's the that's yeah, yeah. um I, I mean uh i don't know if you ever have you ever listened to the band ninja spy before yes yeah there's a song called evolution of the skid oh that, i know that, that song I, I love, oh, love that song. 
it's got so much groove and so much jump. Uh, it's it's kind of got everything. That, so that's that's another one I'd recommend, anyways, for your list. You whichever one you want to put on the list, I guess. Uh, you know, I'll <laughs> I'll add all three. I'll add uh, yeah. I'll, I'll put gravy on, and I'll put uh, the ginger song in Evolution of the Skid. That's yeah. yeah. I, I don't even remember where I heard that Evolution of the Skid song. Like it, it popped up somewhere, and it's just stuck. So I, I've I've a bunch of times. So I've gone and see them. They they come to Saskatoon. They were coming here quite regularly. Really? Um, they were they were here like three times, four times in one year. They were really good friends, with Sparky, and so the Sparky guys kept inviting them out here every time. And so they would do tours through, and, and Sparky would open for them, and they would bring out you know another band from around the region here, and, and three of them would play. And I and I went, religiously was going out to them every time because they're they're a hell of a lot of fun live. Like yeah. they've got some great moves great energy you know just and they're brothers all three of them are brothers three yeah. three pieces brothers. all three of them yeah it's weird i mean it's yeah. cool I mean, yeah and they're all ridiculously talented on their instrument and they all sing <laughs> so yeah it's, it's insane to me yeah. that how so. that's awesome well thanks a lot chris for coming on i appreciate it um i'm gonna i'm gonna plug all your stuff on all my social media stuff like i'll share all your stuff and uh Thanks again for coming on. Had a good Absolutely, time. man. Thank you me. No problem. Appreciate it. Take care. Take care, man. This has been episode 32 of Lost Signals, and we'll see you out there.